Hello and welcome to another Alpha Audio video. Today we're gonna do some freewheeling because I don't really have a script except for some pointers to keep, you know, to keep it a bit on track maybe. But we're gonna talk about analog interlinks. You might have noticed that we recently published a huge article about uh, our investigation into interlinks and we tried to measure some stuff and combine it with our listening test and it was a yeah it was quite the project so to say i think it took about four months maybe uh, to set up the measuring equipment uh, know what to measure get all the cables listen to it measure all of it and now we still have to do the speaker cables, but yeah, you know, we kind of know what to look for now. So that will be a bit easier than the interlinks because honestly, it is really, really hard to measure cables. Um, so why did we do it in the first place? Well, um, I'm kind of sick about people saying that cables don't matter. Uh, and that only blind tests will work. Uh, you know all the claims, like all cables sound the same. E people even say that all DA converters sound the same and all amplifiers sound the same. M maybe the next thing is that all speakers sound the same. Uh, we all know that hi-fi equipment has a certain signature and it, it's, it, it's the decks sound different, amplifiers sound different, speakers sound different, uh, but also cables sound different. And I think we've proven that in this huge test, uh, because there are definitely differences in uh, the measurements. And some of the measurements we could attach to certain sound characters, and that was really nice to see. Uh, but I'm trying, I will try to explain it in this video because um, I get that it's pretty hard to read the article for some people that are not technical at all. I tried to write it down as simple as possible, but yeah, some things I are just really hard to explain without showing a picture and point where you have to look. Um, so how did we did this test? Well, first of all, I didn't do it on my own. I really did it with some help uh, because it's hard. Um, Kees Ruitenberg from Ruitenberg uh, Consulting helped a lot. Uh, Guido Tent from Grimm helped uh, pointing out some stuff I should look at. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Garth Powell from AudioQuest helped out a lot by answering loads of questions about their cables. And uh, Martijn helped a lot by listening to <laughs> 32 interlinks. I'm sorry, Martijn. And Dick uh, is one of our readers, helped out in the first round by listening to 16 cables. So thank you a lot as well. And well, uh, I got a lot of support from a lot of people um, because, you know, four months on one subject is not easy. Um, so, um, and we wrote to all the cable manufacturers as well, of course, and we wrote to all manufacturers we know of and uh, well we got 17 brands in our interlink uh, test and about the same for our speaker cable test so thank you a lot for that as well because without help from the industry or technical people or lending out your good ears we can't do this kind of stuff it's it's a big project and um, we didn't measure only frequency response because what I noticed in a lot of tests is that they just sweep from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz say it's flat so it doesn't matter um, yeah and they are right in that sense I mean all cables uh, not speaker cables but all interconnects are pretty much flat in frequency response up to maybe even 500 kilohertz um, but still we hear differences, don't we? So I know that they're all measuring flat in terms of frequency response, but I still heard a lot of differences, especially in stereo imaging, you know, 3D in depth or in width, 
and in terms of how the ambience is uh, rep uh, reproduced, uh, if a singer is in a large room, you could hear the, the you should hear the reflection from the back wall or the side walls. And if they're in a small room, you should hear that the room is smaller as well. And some cables do that perfectly well, and other cables just don't give you that sense of scale. And now that's where the differences are between interconnects and of course you have detail and layering and maybe a little bit of sound balance like one is warmer than the other, uh, one has more top end than the other and we could see that as well in our measurements. So we didn't only measure frequency response, what we measured uh, a lot of other stuff like speed. We had a uh, a pulse generator and a very fast scope, and the pulse generator generated two nanosecond pulses. Um, so we had the, the pulse, it's two nanoseconds wide, and then a break, I think it was 10 or maybe 20 nanoseconds, uh, nothing, and then the other, and then an, another pulse. So we had enough room to isolate the two nanosecond pulse to look at how fast is it traveling through the cable. And the reason we wanted to know that is uh, delay. Uh, not that you can hear delay, but I'm curious uh, about how fast the cable is. Maybe there's a so sound signature coming from that. There wasn't. But we could also see the spectral decay. I mean, the cable holds energy. And if you shoot a very fast pulse into that, you can see the bump going down. I will show you on a screenshot because it's really important how that bump is, uh, how fast the energy is, is going down and how much harmonics are in that bump because that actually showed how dry the cable sounded. It's really funny. If you see the pattern, you think, oh, there's something there. <laughs> and it makes sense because um, that spectral decay shows which frequencies are uh, still uh, uh, holding energy, uh, if there are reflections in the cable and stuff like that. So you, I'll show you a picture and I'll show you some differences because if I look at, for example, um, the Vanden Hill uh, MC Silver, you can see that the spectral decay is way different from, for example, a Grimm TP, uh, SQM. The SQM is sounding much drier than the uh, Vanden Hill MC Silver. And if I grab a, a QED 40i, you can see that the spectral decay is different again from the other two, uh, and that it's much more brighter sounding than, for example, um, the Mogami interlink. And now you can see that the sound signature is actually a little bit represented in the spectral decay. So that's funny to see. Now there's another test I wanted uh, to present to you because it didn't make any sense in the first, uh, when I first looked at it, because we measured frequency response up to 10 megahertz. And we did that to see how the phase uh, is uh, compared to each other. And you don't see anything relevant up to one megahertz. I mean, they're all flat up to 500 kilohertz or something. But then I sensed that the cables that drop off more actually sounded drier. And that's weird because we're not bats and <laughs> we can hear up to 20 kilohertz if we're very young. So why do we still hear a difference in sound signature when a cable drops off more at like one or two megahertz. I think it has to do with the cable, cable geometry and it's related to the spectral decay as well because the cables that have more decay actually rounded off sooner and more than cables that have less decay and maybe that has something to do with the bandwidth in a cable. But anyways, the cables that we measured that dropped off pretty much sounded drier than cables that were brighter. And I, this doesn't say anything about the quality of the cable. I mean, there are very detail-rich, very pleasant cables that still 
uh, have more energy loss at higher frequencies. Like, for example, uh, the Dirholm division. It's a very nice sounding warmish cable, but it's kind of dry, but it sounded pleasant, pleasant as well. So, um, now I, I was ahead of my schedule, but anyway, uh, we, like I said, we auditioned all 32 cables. Uh, we did 16 per day, so we had two full days of listening. That did go very well, to be honest, and it's actually thanks to Martijn, because he said we should do four cables, then take a break, start with a reference again, do four cables, take a break, start with the reference again, take four cables. And it worked really, really well. I wasn't really tired during the listening sessions. Um, you start fresh after a break. We have our reference cable, it's the Grim TPM. I love that cable. It's very neutral, very well uh, balanced. It's not the best cable I have, but it's a very nice cable and it doesn't cost a fortune as well. So that worked very well. And we actually randomized the cables. I mean, uh, I just put all 32 cables in a sheet, uh, numbered them, and Martijn picked a random number and we auditioned that cable. They didn't know what cable was playing. It wasn't blind, but they didn't know what cable was playing. And we all didn't know the pricing of the cables. So in that sense, it's semi-blind. Um, not that I believe in blind tests, because we don't have anything to gain by preferring one cable over the other. Simple as that. Uh, actually, two or three participants were sponsors of Alpha Audio, and that's not a secret. I mean, we have to make money, we have sponsors. But two or three were sponsors, maybe, and the rest wasn't even sponsoring this article. Uh, so in that sense, we don't have anything to gain from uh, thinking that one cable is better. That was also not the point of this review. So it, it was just to show you what can we measure in cable quality. Um, so that's about blind testing or not blind testing. I think it was kind of semi-blind. Uh, and we all agreed on the characteristics of the cables as well. So that was really reassuring because what I heard, Martijn heard, and Dick actually also heard. So that was pretty stable and uh, funny actually <laughs> to see that all three were agreeing on certain elements in the sound character as well. And some people actually re uh, uh, posted on Facebook that they had the same feeling with the cables uh, they heard and we heard. So there is definitely a certain signature in certain cables. Um, what can we conclude? What can we measure and what can't we measure and what can we hear and what can we combine in measurements and what we can actually hear? Like I said, the spectral decay really tells you whether a cable is kind of dry or is kind of lively. That's really funny. And it shows you an airiness in the cable as well, I think. I mean, all the cables that we thought were sounding bright, open, fresh, had a pretty slow decay because it holds the energy more. Uh, well, the, and they were up in the region, I'll show you on screen how to read it because it's really about how fast the bump goes down and how the bump goes down. We could also see that, pe that, that cables that didn't round off as much in the frequency response test actually sounded more airy, open and bright. That was also really funny to see. And I think the two are linked uh, because of bandwidth. That's what I think. Well, all the LCR measurements pretty much didn't say anything. <laughs> it was also pretty funny. So all the people that said, well, it didn't matter because our LCR meter uh, tells you this or that, nah, doesn't really tell you anything about a cable, except for impedance, capacitance, inductance. Yeah, well, 
I couldn't link impedance to sound quality. Not in interconnects. It does with speaker cables. But that's another video. But capacitance and inductance, my feeling says there is something. I mean, too high a capacitance isn't good and too high an inductance is also not good. Um, but I couldn't really link levels of inductance or levels of capacitance to sound quality. Not yet, at least. Maybe it needs some more investigation, but in all the sheets we made, I couldn't see anything that, that I could link to a certain sound signature or a uh, quality. Uh, propagation time is not relevant. I mean, I couldn't, slower cables weren't sounding worse than faster cables, but propagation variance does have a signature. And I noticed, uh, because we did a test that was pretty fascinating, uh, in which we had, uh, we altered the voltage of the pulse and we measured the time difference between the reference pulse and the pulse that was going through the cable. And there we actually could see differences because when I uh, altered the voltage, the timing uh, shifted. So, for example, we have a cable uh, uh, that um, was pretty, well, the stock cable, for example. We measured it around, I don't know, let, let's say at 1.5 volts, it's 10 nanoseconds, for example. If I lower the voltage to a half, half a volt, uh, 0.5 volt, the, the timing could be 10.3 uh, uh, nanoseconds, so it gets slower. And if I bump it down to 0.3 volts, it could be 10.6 nanoseconds, for example. It's not exactly that, but you get the point. And there were cables that just gradually got slower. There were cables that were gradually got faster, but there were also cables that actually got faster than slower or slower than faster. And if it's varying, then actually the timing is dependent on the amplitude of the signal and you get different timings if the amplitude goes up and down. And that's actually music. I mean, music is dynamic. So your timing is varying up and down if your amplitude goes up and down. That can't be good. <laughs> I can't believe that's good. So it was actually really hard to measure this because you need to place a marker. And if you alter the voltage, um, the, the, uh, so the, the square wave or sine wave uh, the pulse gets distorted a little bit. I mean, it's like a 500 megahertz signal. It's ridic ridiculous, of course, but we needed such a short pulse to see stuff. And if your amp if your square wave or pulse uh, distorts, the the trigger will uh, shift as well. So it, we did our very very best to place the markers accurately, but it's hard. So it's kind of an yeah, you need to s don't see it as absolute values. It's it's kind of in the ballpark there. Uh, but it is con there are cables that go up and down. There are cables that just get slower a little bit. Cables that that got faster a little bit. And we could see that cables were that were bright sounding actually got faster gradually. Cables that got uh, that sounded a little bit dull actually got slower a little bit. But cables that go up and down felt a little bit off uh, and kind of, yeah, mm, you couldn't pinpoint the, the timing and that makes sense. So that's what we found. Uh, this investigation is not finished yet. Uh, I, th I have the feeling we're just scratching the surface here, uh, but uh, it was really fascinating to do this. And um, yeah, it was fun and very tiring, but we still need to do speaker cables now. So I can't stop now. We want to finish this before the High End Munich show. And after that, I'm definitely gonna take a break. <laughs> Thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.